So without further ado, Philadelphia and all of those watching on live stream, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Ravi Zacharias. so much. Please be seated. Thank you. Oh, Josiah, I wish I could have a voice like yours. <laughs> well done. Guy has done some work before behind the lectern, I, am, I have no doubt. Aaron, thank you. Thank you for your team. He does an amazing job in preparing for this. Uh, now I can see why Moses said, here are my Lord, send Aaron. And you, have, <clears throat> you do a good job in just planning and preparing. Uh, we are honored to be here. It's not too often that I get me, and she's here as well, uh, all the way from Atlanta uh, with, four, with four grandchildren. I lose Margie is here to join me, and some of my colleagues as well. But you guys make me nervous. You're sitting there in these large numbers, and I wonder why you have come. I don't know if they were giving free pizza afterwards or what. Uh, when I was at your stage in life, the only reason I would go for such an event is that they were giving free food. Uh, first time I ever attended a Christian event, my sister was trying to get me there and I said no. She said they were gonna serve refreshments afterwards. And so that's what brought me in. I don't know what brings you here, but thank you for coming. I am honored that you will give me a hearing. I will be joined as the director of our Apologetics Institute in Atlanta, Georgia, formerly a tutor at Oxford, a graduate from not far from this place, did his master's work at Princeton and his doctoral work at Oxford. Vince is an amazing young scholar and part of our team. He and his wife, Jo, both of them did their doctoral studies at Oxford. Uh, I co-authored a couple of books with him, including the last one, uh, that Dia dealt with Jesus among secular gods. So when I finish my talk this evening, Vince will come, on, come up to the platform to take your questions. You know, recently, uh, Time Magazine had on its cover the lead story, Truth is Dead, which is quite fascinating to me because in the 60s, uh, it was uh, God is Dead on Time uh, cover, and then 70s, Marx is Dead, and then in the 80s, somebody said, God is dead and Marx is dead, and I'm not feeling too well myself. And so it was very fitting now to say, truth is dead as well. Now, the fact of the matter is, if that statement was true, then one wonders what the article was actually about. Uh, Self-defeating to the very core. But I wanna talk to you a little bit about this subject, obviously, question could be very simply, if not simplistically, responded to. But we have to navigate our way to wonder and ask how we really got to this place. I remember arriving in the West at the age of 20 in the mid-60s to move to Toronto, Canada. And I watched the culture dramatically shifting before my eyes so that by the time I finished my undergraduate studies and then did my graduate work, we were living in a very different world. It was during the peak of the Vietnam War. In fact, in the early 70s, I had the privilege of going to Vietnam, even though I was living in Canada at that time and noticing the anguish of the Western world, wondering, why we were involved in those kinds of conflicts at all. And the younger generation just rose up in a kind of a rebellion against absolutes, a rebellion against authority, a rebellion against the establishment. And as we look back now upon the last 50 years, we are living in a dramatically different world today to a point where if you were to be honest in a conversation around a table, you would actually be very daring to say, I am very optimistic about the future. Some years ago, I heard this cute little story about a Russian, about a Texan, a sheriff, who had gone into Mexico to look for a criminal who'd been plundering their banks. The criminal's name was Jose Rivera. 
So this sheriff from Texas with a huge girth about him went into Mexico and he was going from village to village and town to town and arrived in this bar room and he looked at the bartender and said, I hear Jose Rivera hangs around these parts. I am looking for the bandit Jose Rivera. And the bartender gradually raised his eyes and he said, see the man at the corner table there? Sheriff sure, says yes. Said, That's Jose Rivera. That's the man you're looking for. But I want to tell you, he doesn't speak English. So the sheriff said, well, you do. Why don't you interpret for me? So they walked over to the corner and the sheriff looked at him and said, are you Jose Rivera? And the interpreter looked at the man and says, he wants to know if you're Jose Rivera. Jose Rivera says, Send, tell him, yes, what about it? So he looks at the sheriff and says, Jose Rivera says, yes, what about it? The sheriff says, tell him that I need to know where every penny is from all these banks he's robbed, where he put it away. I want to find out where he's got them stashed. And if he doesn't tell me where it is and I don't get it back, I'm going to shoot to kill. So he looks at Jose Rivera and says, the sheriff here says, he needs every penny back. He wants to know where you've stashed all this money away, where you've put it away, and if you don't tell him where it is, he's going to shoot to kill. So Jose Rivera pauses and says, okay, tell him to step out of this bar, make a left turn, go for about 100 yards, he'll see a well. Right next to that well, he'll see a gigantic tree. Towards the portion of the well from the tree, if he digs a hole, about three feet deep, there's an encasement built out of concrete. All the bags of money are right there. Tell him he can get it and to take it and to leave me alone. So the interpreter looks at the sheriff and says, Jose Rivera says, <laughs> Jose Rivera says, go ahead and shoot. Now, why do I not need to interpret that story for you? At least for most of you. Probably get it. Because you see, when the truth does not serve your purposes, all of a sudden, truth doesn't matter. When you're on the wrong end of the stick, and have been told a lie, you want to fight for the truth. But when you're on the right end of it in some ways, but it doesn't serve your purposes, you will manipulate and distort and tell a story with all kinds of fanciful interpretations. Sometimes the truth is the simplest way to go, but when we deviate from it, we make life often more complicated. Was it not Aldous Huxley in his book, Ends and Means, who made a comment? I guess the sound seems to go off and on here. Hopefully you can hear me through the night. Huxley made this staggering comment. I want this world not to have meaning. I want this world not to have meaning because a meaningless world frees me to my own political and my erotic pursuits. A meaningless world frees me to my own political and erotic pursuits. I want to read for you a passage that goes back 2,000 years and Jesus is standing before Pontius Pilate it's an amazing conversation on the question of truth. Everything of politics and ethnicity and racial tensions and religious oppression comes right into this conversation. All the issues that divided people in that day come right into this conversation. Jesus has been brought by the religious authorities, not anybody else. They've brought him because they do not respect or appreciate what it is he's really pointing to about their own hypocrisies and the politicization of religion. So they bring him in and he's standing before Pilate. 
Pilate is afraid to deal with it as he wanted to because he's torn between Rome and trying to manage one of these principalities. Here's the conversation. Pilate then, where Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? It's been very easy for Jesus to answer the question, but he questions his questioner. He says this, is this your own idea or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people, your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you've really done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my sermons would, have fight, would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Ah, you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you're right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, Pilate asked and walked away. Amazing. All the issues that divided them, all the issues that spawned hate. And Jesus' first questioner, question to the questioner, was to cause him to open up within his own assumptions. Whenever you are asked a question, Questioning the questioner does two things. It opens the questioner within his or her own assumptions and changes the entry point of the discussion. That is why C.S. Lewis said, nothing is so self-defeating as a question that has been raised without taking the question itself to its logical conclusion. You see, intent is prior to content. To give truth, said George MacDonald, to give truth to him who doesn't love it is to only give him more multiplied reasons for misinterpretation. To give truth to somebody who doesn't love it is to give them more multiplied reasons for misinterpretation. If you're not looking for the truth, any answer that is given to you will only give you more reasons to misinterpret what it is that has actually been said. I look at the search for truth in a simple one, two, three, four, five grid. One, the ultimate pursuit of your life and my life should be the truth. That's what we really must pursue. Number two, there are two true theories, theories of truth the correspondence theory and the coherence theory. We use this in a court of law every day. Particular questions need corresponding answers that are true. And when all of the answers are put together, you're looking for coherence so that there is no systemic contradiction in what it is that's been said. That's why witnesses are cross-examined. They may give a truth here and a truth there, but if they throw in a lot of lies in the middle, it is the task of the lawyer then to dismantle that story and say your answers are incoherent. So there are two complementary theories, correspondence for particular statements, coherence for all of the statements ultimately put together. But then we are given three tests for truth logical consistency, empirical adequacy, and experiential relevance. Number one, the pursuit of truth. Number two, correspondence and coherence. Number three, logically consistent, empirically adequate, and experientially relevant. These are classic statements that come together in truth claims. But then you have to ask the question, what are the questions the truth claims are really answering? There are four questions, origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Where do I come from? What does life mean? How do I differentiate between good and evil? What happens to a human being when he or she moves on from their earthly existence? Every worldview takes these four questions of origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. And then there are five disciplines that really come to bear. Metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, anthropology, and ultimately you deal with theology as well. So you've got metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, 
anthropology, and theology. These five converging disciplines come to bear in the answer of the one question of truth that deals with origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. And by the way, that is why the Greeks formed the universities, because they were looking for unity in diversity, as the diversity of disciplines were answering the basic questions of virtue, value, meaning, and justice. University settings are supposed to be dealing with these issues. What is truth? Correspondence, coherence, empirical adequacy, logical consistency, experiential relevance, origin, meaning, morality, destiny, and the five disciplines that you bring to bear. This is the reality with which we must live and with which we must find our answers. Some years ago, when I was doing a semester study at Ridley Hall in Cambridge, my wife and a couple of our children went into the famous court of Old Bailey, where you can come and sit in the galleries and watch a trial in progress. You don't really know what trial you're getting into until you hear some of the arguments taking place. And we were not familiar with the process at all, so we walked into this and we suddenly realized it was a highly contentious trial going on of a man in his senior years who had been accused by two minor girls of raping them. So our younger daughter actually had to leave out of there because she was not old enough to sit through the trial. And as we were watching this, I first cast my eyes upon the man who had been accused of doing this horrific deed. You couldn't really see the girls because they were minors, but you could hear their voices and the monitors in front of the barristers could be, they could see their faces and they were questioning them. You could hear their very, very young voices. And after the charges had been laid and what he'd been accused of and the date and when and what happened, the lawyer defending this man took to the microphone. His opening comment was riveting. And he looked at the two girls in the monitors and he said this, I'm going to ask you girls to do just one thing. I don't want to make you nervous. I don't want to make you upset. I don't want to make you scared. And if you don't have the answer to what I ask you, tell me and I will move to the next question. But if you answer my question, I just want to make sure of one thing. You tell me the truth. That's all I'm asking you. Just tell me the truth. If you don't know the answer, tell me. But if you answer it, tell me the truth. Do you understand? They said yes. Of course, you're thinking of them, what, sort of 11 and 12 or 13 or something like that. They're young kids. And the questioning begins, and they're answering sometimes with hesitancy and so on and so forth. Finally, he loads this question up. He said, can I ask you one question? On the day that you said it happened, why did it take you two months to tell your mommy and daddy what happened two months before? And they are struggling with an answer at this point. Then he throws this one. He says, is it true that the day you decided to tell your mommy and daddy, this man, saw you in such and such a place, doing such and such a thing, and he walked up to you on his way back from the office when he saw you doing that and said, I'm coming to see your mommy and daddy tonight and tell you where I saw you. Is it true? One girl says, I can't remember. And another one is fudging through the answers. All of a sudden, the trial was taking a turn. And here you're sitting there thinking to yourself, if it is true, this is a horrible human being. If it's not true, they are totally destroying his life. One court case, one court case, did the truth matter? My wife and I were talking this morning about a friend I know who is 73, 
three and a half years ago, he was incarcerated for a crime he swears he never committed. And he was put away for 45 plus years. I went to see him a few weeks after he was incarcerated. He looked like a shadow of himself. He said, Ravi, you are made to become like animals in here. He is living with 69 other people in the same room and he swears to his heart, I never did what I'm accused of. He's gone through two or three appeal processes and the last one was just denied two days ago. He's just pleading with those who prosecute him, prosecuted him to give the contents of the documents of what they knew about his accuser would have destroyed the accuser's testimony. He said, that's all I'm asking for. All I want is tell the people what you knew which you didn't introduce, which I pleaded with you to introduce. All he wants is the facts. He's not asking for a change in judgment. Just give the people the facts when you're trying me. He's in his 70s and his wife and he were saving up all of their money over the years to spend their retirement years together. He's gone for life. Does the truth matter? You see, when you're on the wrong end of a lie here and the reception of a lie, you realize how important and vitally important it is that you know the truth. And so, ladies and gentlemen, my one plea to you is this. If it matters in the particularity of a court case, how much more must it matter about giving the definition for what life is all about? And that's why Oscar Wilde, on his deathbed, in his 40s, after having lived an indulgent life, looks at his Friend Robbie Ross and says to him, Robbie, did you love any one of those boys for their own sake? And Robbie looks at him and says, I didn't, Oscar, what about you? He said, neither did I. Bring me a priest. All of a sudden, the truth about love came home to a man who was a genius and brilliant in his artistic splendor and he wanted to know the true meaning of love right as he was breathing his last breaths. Winston Churchill said, truth is the most valuable thing in the world. It is so valuable that oftentimes it's hidden by a bodyguard of lies. It is the most valuable thing in the world, but oftentimes it is hidden by a bodyguard of lies. Natan Sharansky, the former Justice Minister of Israel had been incarcerated in this former Soviet Union. And years afterwards, he pleaded for permission to go back to the prison where he'd been kept in solitary confinement. And the Soviets gave him the permission to come back. So as he was about to enter the prison, he put his arm out and told his wife, please, let me go in by myself. I want to go in by myself because that's where I really found myself. I'll let you come in later, but I want to go in alone, where I spent all this time in aloneness. He goes in, and when he comes out of there with the tears running down his face, he asked to visit the grave of the Soviet physicist Andrei Sakharov, who gave to the Soviets the atomic bomb. Of all the places he wanted to go, he asked for that grave site. So he goes over to the grave site, and he lays a wreath there, and there's a battery of microphones waking, waiting from asking him why. And he says this. He says, Sakharov gave to you all the atomic bomb. But before he died, he made this statement. I always thought the most powerful weapon in the world was the bomb. I have changed my mind. The most powerful weapon in the world is not the bomb. The most powerful weapon in the world is the truth. Today, the Soviets, voted a no in the resolution to condemn the use of chemical weapons in Syria. What has happened to a civilization that can kill so mercilessly and then say, I'm not gonna vote for a resolution that condemns it. They try to tell us they are united. It's not so. It was also years ago 
when that Korean airline, I've taken Korean airlines many, many times, scores of times. In fact, my wife has been on that very aircraft, that very flight number 007 that goes to Seoul. 007 is flying to Seoul, and over Soviet airspace, they are shot down and the bodies come collapsing into the debris. At the end of it, they were accused of having brought down the civilian airliner, but they made up all kinds of stories for it. And in fact, one of the things they said was that when they were ordered to turn their lights on, the Korean pilot did not comply. So these two fighter jets come and bomb this thing out of, it, out of the air. There was a conversation between Vladimir Posner of Pravda and William Sapphire. William Sapphire looked at Posner, he said, Vladimir, how could you all do this? How could you all do this? And he said, Mr. Sapphire, they did not comply with the command. Sapphire says, what was the command? To turn your lights on. They did not comply. Sapphire says, but they did. The lights were on. He says, no, they were not. He said, we ha have the recording before me. Their lights were on. One of your pilots tells the other pilots that the lights were on. He says, no, 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 the pilot was referring to the other pilot, the other Russian pilot, that his light was on. Sapphire says, can I quote the exact transcript for you? Target's lights are on. Silence. Does the truth matter? Now here is where the whole thing has to be unpacked and I want to give it to you as quickly as I can with some answers hopefully at the end. See, truth, Follow me now, please. Truth comes in two garbs. It comes in propositional fashion of whether the statements are correspondingly true. But truth in the ultimate sense comes in the form of does life have meaning? Truth and meaning are inextricably joined because truth and love are inextricably joined. And if love is the supreme ethic and we all pursue love, love is indispensable for meaning. And if love is inextricably joined to truth, then truth and love have to address the question of meaning. Malcolm Muggeridge gives us these two nuances of thought. Listen to them, one from his book, The Green Stick, A Chronicle of Wasted Years. And he was a journalist talking. Truth is very beautiful, more so I consider than justice, which is today's pursuit that easily puts on a false face. In the nearly seven decades I have lived through, the world has overflowed with bloodshed and explosions whose dust has never had time to settle before others have erupted, all in purportedly just causes. The quest for justice continues and the weapons of hatred are piling up. But truth was an early casualty. The lies on behalf of which our wars have been fought and our peace treaties concluded. The lies of revolution and counter-revolution. The lies of advertising, of news, of salesmanship, of, po of politics. The lies Lies of the priest in his pulpit, the professor at his podium, the journalist at his typewriter. The lie stuck like a fishbone in the throat of the microphone. The handheld lies of the prowling cameraman. Ignatius Salone told me once when he was a member of the old Comintern, some stratagem was under discussion and a delegate, a newcomer who had never attended before, made the extraordinary observation that if such and such a statement were to be made, it ought not to be made because it wouldn't be true. There was a moment of dazed, stunned silence. Then everyone began to laugh. They laughed and laughed until tears ran down their cheeks and the Kremlin halls seemed to shake. The same laughter echoes in every council chamber and cabinet room, wherever two or more together exercise to exercise authority. It is truth that has died, not God. This comes from a journalist. Then he went on to say this, which I think is so powerful and needs to be followed as carefully. He reminds us of the fact that how we in life look for reality and something solid. Here's what he says. In this sargasso sea of fantasy and fraud, how can I or anyone else hope to swim unencumbered? How can I learn to see through and not with the eye? How can I take off my own motley and wash away my makeup, raise the iron shutter, put out the studio lights, silence the sound effects, and put the cameras to sleep? 
Will I ever watch the sunrise on Sunset Boulevard and set over forest lawn? Can I find truth among the studio props, silence in a discotheque, love in a striptease? Will I read truth of an auto cue and catch it on a screen, chase it on the wings of Muzak, view it in living color in the news? Can I hear it in living sound along the motorways, nor in the wind that rent the mountains or broken piece of the rocks, nor in the earthquake that followed, nor in the fire that followed the earthquake, but it is in a still small voice, nor in the screeching of tires either or the grinding of brakes, nor in the roar of jets or the whistle of trombones, nor in the rattle of drums or the chanting of demo voices. Again and again and again I'm reminded it's that still small voice, the voice of God, if one could only catch it. I had the privilege of being with Malcolm Muggeridge seven months before he died. He was a hedonistic writer, a journalist who wrote stories to just be pompous in his vocabulary. And then in his latter years, as he gave his life to Christ, now bent over his face like that of a gargoyle peering over a wall. As I sat and had a lunch of just bread and cheese with him, he talked to me of all the years he wasted peddling lies. As a journalist, and how the supreme truth and the beauty of Jesus so transformed him. How did we get here? How did we get to this point of losing meaning and losing truth? Let me trace it for you quickly. Three moods took over the West. And I'll be so blatant as to tell you this, if the West does not wake up as to what is being done to her and what we are seeing happen, if the West doesn't wake up, there will be no remnants, even the good aspects of a civilization that has done so much of good not perfect, and a lot of hurts, and a lot of misjudgments, and a lot of pain, but it's been learned, and what is happening, we may ultimately be overrun by a demagogic worldview, which takes away the very thing that gives you some of the greatness, your freedom, your freedom. I was in a country last week that I shall leave unnamed, where our lives were in danger. And we had to be extremely careful what we said, where we said, where we gathered. And when you come back home and set foot on American soil again, you realize what a wonderful privilege we have. We had dared not squander it. But the three moods, number one, the mood of secularization, number two, the mood of pluralization, and number three, the world of privatization. Secularization basically said, where religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. Peter Berger defines it that way. A process by which religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. Now let me be careful in what I'm saying to you here. I do not believe religion should ever be politicized. I do not believe religion should ever be enforced. Any country that has politicized religion has destroyed both politics and religion. We always need to have the privilege of belief or unbelief, the privilege of belief or disbelief. Secularism is the right way to undergird a government, but if it is enforced to a point of losing any transcendent perspective, then you find a different path to destruction taking over. I want to thank the authorities here at Temple for giving us the privilege of meeting here. We can't enforce a belief, but we ought to be able to discuss it in peaceable ways and have the opportunity to weigh in what it is that's true and what it is that false. You see, when secularization has its logical outwork, and yes, please do share the mic. Our universities will be great if they allow this cordial debate, if they allow the freedom to express and let intelligent people make up their minds in the process. But if secularization takes place to a logical outworking without any transcendent perspective, what you end up losing is an absolute definition for what life is all about anyway. 
And what happens when those definitions are lost, there's a blurring of distinctions. What do I mean by that? You see, right from the beginning of the story in the Genesis narrative, there was only one law, only one law. That law was, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What does that mean? Don't play God. Don't play God. You cannot be the ultimate source of the defining of good and evil. And what happened? The temptation comes and God says, in the day you do it, you're going to die. And the tempter says, uh-uh, in the day you do it, you're going to be as God. Why don't you be God? And the moment they took upon themselves the prerogative of defining right and wrong, good and evil, the collapse began. Today we need thousands of pages just for our health laws. For life itself, there was only one law. But for our health laws, we need thousands of pages. Why? Because every statement can die the death of a thousand qualifications. Three of your students here yesterday had a home invasion take place. And one of them says, I was absolutely terrified one with a gun to the head, another with a knife to the back. See, lawlessness is a horrible thing. Violence is a horrible thing. And when you change definitions, what actually happens, you cannot define anything with certainty anymore. When a famous trial was held in Atlanta, Georgia for a pornographic entrepreneur, they said his pornography was so vile so vile that it made Playboy magazine look like a child's magazine. But when those who were witnessing against that magazine were questioned by the lawyer defending the pornographic producer, he looked at the witnesses and asked them this question. Have you ever been to an art gallery? Yes. Have you ever been to an art gallery where there are painting by the, paintings by the Grand Masters? Yes. Have you ever been to an art gallery paintings by the Grand Masters of disrobed people? Yes. Would you please tell this jury why you call that art and you call my stuff pornography? The lawyer was clever. I'd just like to ask the lawyer how many people he's seen whose marriages are broken because one partner used to go to art galleries. We know it. We know what we are talking about. We know it very well, but it's the same Jose Rivera story. We don't come right out and talk about the seduction of that which could break my heart and break the heart of my family and break my bank and break my home. My, my daughter Naomi is a wee little thing. In Tamil, they say the smallest peppers are the hottest peppers. They referred to her as the Kanderi Mulaga, that tiny, that tiny pepper. She works rescuing women from the sex trafficking industry. She's gone to the brothels in some countries I cannot even name for you, and she doesn't even tell me when she's going there. One day I looked at her and said, why do you do this? She said, Dad, when we were young, you were going to dangerous places. We asked you why you did it, and you told us we had to trust God. It's your turn now. <laughs> Amsterdam, Bangkok, Mumbai. She walks into the brothels with a Bible in her purse. The lives she has rescued have amazing stories, absolutely amazing stories. Here's what she said to me. She said, Dad, every one of these guys who comes and plunders these young women began his journey with pornography till he destroyed his conscience, and this was the only end to it all. Never met a man who was going to see a prostitute because he'd just come from an art gallery. <laughs> Do we not know the difference? Really? Secularization will blur the definitions till we will not know the difference between the sacred and the profane. Pluralization ends up destroying reason. There is no logic anymore. 
In fact, the very day Oxford University talked about the new word for the dictionary this year, post-truth, the same day France was announcing a post-logic culture. A post-logic culture. We no longer believe in logic, no longer believe in reason. If you cannot reason with a person, something has died because we are intended to think from a minor premise to major premise to deduction to inference, the law of rational inference we work with all the time. But we've lost truth and we've lost logic. G.K. Chesterton talks about this society and I will move very quickly to my closing. Chesterton puts it this way, the new rebel who rebels against all absolutes and will not trust enti and entirely trust anything is a new kind of creature. He has no loyalty, therefore he can never be a revolutionist. And the fact that he doubts everything gets in his way when he wants to denounce anything. For all denunciation implies a moral doctrine of some kind. And the modern revolutionists doubt not only the institution he denounces, but the doctrine by which he denounces it. So he writes one book complaining the imperial oppression insults the purity of women. Then he writes another book, a novel, in which he insults it himself. He curses the Sultan because Christian girls lose their virginity. Then curses Mrs. Grundy because they keep it. As a politician, he cries out that war is a waste of life, and then as a philosopher, that actually life itself is a waste of time. A Russian pessimist will denounce a policeman for killing a peasant, then prove by the highest philosophical principles that the peasant ought to have killed himself. A man denounces marriage as a lie, then denounces aristocratic profligates for treating it as a lie. He calls the flag a bubble, then blames the oppressors of Poland or Ireland because they take away that bubble. The man of this school goes first to a political meeting where he complains that savages are treated as if they were beasts, then he takes his hat and umbrella and goes on to a scientific meeting where he proves that they practically our beast. In short, the modern revolutionist, being an infinite skeptic, is always engaged in undermining his own minds. In his book on politics, he attacks men for trampling on morality. In his book on ethics, he attacks morality for trampling on men. The modern man in revolt has become practically useless for all purposes of revolt. By rebelling against everything, he's lost his right to rebel against anything. Wow. Secularization, pluralization, which moves to the last one, privatization, no meaning. No meaning, because we sever the connection between the public and the private. We sever the meaning between the public and the private, and life becomes fragmented. Today, I got a message from a friend through another friend. I've only met this friend for 45 minutes, the their father guy, and he contacts somebody I've known. He's in the sports industry, thick into sports. And he phones this friend of mine and said, would Ravi be willing to call me? I said, what's going on? His 16-year-old daughter today tried to take her life and almost succeeded. He is there as a single dad watching his daughter in this situation. And I said to my wife when I came back, I said, why didn't he contact his buddies in that industry? I don't even know him. An Academy Award winning actor, I won't name him. I met him only once. And now every now and then I text him. He'd won the Academy Award for the best actor of a great film. He was in Bangkok, Thailand, and the general manager of that hotel where I stay to write my book said, Mr. Zacharias, I know you're here to write. Could you please come and see this man? He needs help. When I walked into the room, I knew him by name. I'd not seen any of his movies. But one look at him, and he had all the aura of a Hollywood star as people were gathering around his table, and he was giving autographs. When I sat down, he told the waiters to keep everybody away. And then he looks at me. He says, I don't know you, but the general manager has talked to me about you. He said, Mr. Zacharias, I have fame, I have the award, I have everything that I wanted, but I'm a deeply wounded man. My life has fallen apart. 
And I remember when we were coming to an end as I put my hand on his huge forearm like that. And his arm was trembling like that. It took me back many decades when I was a young 20-year-old in Toronto. And I'll bring this to a close. It was a snowy night. I was driving along the 401. My wife hails from Toronto. We lived there for 10 years. My family is still there. I'm driving on a snowy night, and on the 401, that wide highway, it's all a whiteout, and there are cars skidding all over the place. And as I looked through my blurry windscreen, I thought I saw a younger boy staggering like that. I said, is that for real? And I slowed down. I was already moving slow, and sure enough, it was a man standing there. I gradually pulled over beyond him, and I rolled my window down, snow's gusting, and I got out and said, what are you doing here? He said, can you take me home? I said, where do you live? He told me I wasn't headed in that direction. I said, get in. So we're driving. He was obviously messed up, completely messed up. And as I dropped him off, his name was Lauren. I said, Lauren, I'm leaving tomorrow morning for some meetings. Can I have your address and phone number? He said, yeah. He said, can I have yours? I said, yeah. So as I get off, I said, when I come back next week, I'm going to see you. I said, okay. He said, I'll make sure. By the time I came back, the newspapers told the story of this young man who doused himself with kerosene and burned himself to death. Not before he sent me a poem that he'd written, lost in a world of darkness without a guiding light, seeking a friend to help my struggling, failing plight. So all of you good people now go on passing by, leaving me with nothing but this lonely will to die. For somewhere in this lonely world of sorrow and of woe, there's a place for me to hide, but where I do not know. For no matter where I go, I never will escape the devil's reaching, clutching hands or the drink of fermented grape. So out of my grief and anguish, Perhaps some wandering boy will see and build his own life true and good and free. Forget if it's true and good and free or pure and good and free. Teenager. See, meaning is essential to love. Love is connected to truth. And so I close with these words to you. See, Jesus never argued with his questioner. He just asked him one question. Are you asking this question sincerely? Or has someone else set you up to answer this, to ask this of me? This is the 500th year of the Reformation. A man by the name of Martin Luther was tired of the institutional church. And as he and a young man by the name of Philip Melanchthon were reading the scriptures, they realized the problem was not out there. The problem is always in here. The problem is not with the Soviets or others. The problem is in your heart and mine. Matthew Paris, who's a articulate writer in England with a lifestyle very different to mine, with a philosophy very different to mine as an atheist. He wrote an article, said, I am torn as an atheist writing this. I'm torn because I don't want to say it. He said, I went to Africa and I came back and I watched what he was, he grew up in Africa. He said, I watched what was happening in some of those towns. It was not that they needed more NGOs. And Matthew Paris said this, what they really needed was the evangelistic message of the gospel for a changed heart. He said, I'm shocked at myself saying this. What they need is the evangelistic message of a changed heart. The gospel message of Jesus Christ is the only one that takes you away from looking outside and starts you from looking within. And Jesus changes that.
You see, that simple verse which you oftentimes see in a ball game and probably laugh at it, John 3.16. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 32 to 33 words. Let me summarize it for you. The starting point is filial. You have a heavenly Father. The goal is relational. He offers to be related to you. The range is eternal. The offer is both conditional and unconditional. He loves you as you are, but asks you to believe and trust. And the foundation is legal, filial, relational, eternal, conditional and unconditional, legal. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I turned 71 two weeks ago, and I said to my family, I'd love to stay home now. I've done it for 40 years. You get tired, but I will not give up. I will keep going. And I will keep going because of young men and women like you, whom I meet wherever I go, and see your lives changed and transformed. As uh, Conrad Adenauer said to Billy Graham shortly after the Second World War, he was looking outside his window at the ruins of Germany, and he turned to Billy Graham and said, Mr. Graham, do you believe Jesus Christ really rose again from the dead? Billy was shocked. He said, Mr. Adenauer, if I didn't believe in that, I would have no gospel to preach. Adenauer paused and he said, Mr. Graham, I just want to say to you this, outside of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I know of no other hope for mankind. We're about to celebrate Easter Sunday. I hope some of you will get to meet the resurrected Christ and know that he is the one. He is the one who brings meaning. He is the one who gives you your definitions. He is the one who gives you your reason to live and move and have your being. May God bless you. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> you want me to stay here? Thank you so much. Please, one more time. One more time. Please be seated. We now are moving on to the second part of the event, which is the question and answer uh, portion. I would like to please invite Vince Vitale to the stage and I will read his bio. Please uh, lend your ear. Vince Vitale is the director of the Zacharias Institute and an itinerant speaker for RZIM. After receiving his bachelor's degree from Princeton University, he went on to study at the University of Oxford where he completed his doctorate in philosophy and philosophy on the problem of evil and suffering. He has now co-authored two books with Dr. Ravi Zacharias in which they wrestle with some of culture's most difficult questions and respond with the answer of Jesus Christ. The books, Why Suffering, released 2014, and Jesus Among Secular Gods, released this year. Vince speaks about the Christian worldview in university settings, churches, and conference centers around the world. Vince Vitale, welcome. So, with the question and answer portion, uh, we have some rules, uh, and we all want rules, don't we? We appreciate them. Um, we ask that your questions be clear, concise, and related to the topic 
uh, of what's been presented this evening. Uh, we are going to give priority to students and to skeptics to come forward uh, and we would invite you to approach the microphone. Uh, you can come from whatever direction, having now understood the rules. Clear, <laughs> concise, and related to the topic of this evening, priority given to students, our future leaders, and to skeptics. Uh, you can now make your way down to the microphone. Uh, you will present your question, uh, and then an answer uh, will be provided from either Dr. Ravi Zacharias or from Vince Vitale. And one question per person, please, or we'll never get out of here. Just yes, and, and one question <laughs> per person, clear, concise, and related to the topic. Good uh -huh. evening. Uh, my name is Ijama. I am a student at Drexel University. And, and so my question was about your comment on, you know, separating religion and politics. So um, if we're to separate those two things, how do we make laws on things like abortion? Should it be completely secularized in the laws that we make, or should it be fa founded on America's Judeo-Christian beliefs? I think that's a great, great question and a very, very tough one. And uh, let me do my best to answer it. And Vince can feel free to add it as well. When Paul was heading to Rome, and uh, many were dissuading him from going there because they say they would finish him off, he said, I'm going to claim my right as a Roman citizen. I'm going to claim my right as a Roman citizen and argue my case as a citizen of Rome. He didn't say, I'm coming from the church that I planted. He didn't say, I'm representing all the churches that I've planted. I'm coming as a citizen of Rome to claim my right. What happens in a world with so many mixed views today, especially pluralization, where there's a competing number of worldviews available to its members? We ought to speak on these issues as a member of society, as a member of a community, as a member that gives me my right to argue for the child and the unborn and the weak and the most victimized. But if I come speaking because I represent the evangelical church or the Protestant church or the Catholic church or whatever it is, you end up all of a sudden getting people to fight against an institution. I think we must speak what you're saying. And so we must speak our conscience and our conviction and why. And the secularist who tells us we are prejudiced and subjective is just plain wrong. No more subjective than the secularist is going to be. The secularist is also speaking very subjectively. We speak from the objective viewpoint that life has intrinsic worth and intrinsic value, not extrinsic worth conveyed by state or society, but intrinsic worth. We talk so much about human rights, we have forgotten about the right to be human. And so, so your, your point is very well taken. I commend you for thinking about that. I just think you speak as one who has a coherent worldview as to why this issue is important, not representing an institution, but representing the absolutes that have built your life, the absolute of dignity, of essential value, of life, of marriage, of home, and of the future. You know, you raise a question right now that is going to have ramifications 10 to 20 years down the line. We are going to find out. Because a worldview is in place right now that seeks to dominate the world. And one of their methods is by raising huge families, you ultimately outnumber the opponents and the opposition. Wouldn't it be ironic that a worldview that has raised huge families is then overpowering one of a worldview that didn't even value its children? then we see why we have been overrun. We will only be defeated if we lose our moral strength 
and our moral basis. We will not be defeated because of politics or military power. We can be defeated if we lose our moral framework. So speak with moral conviction and clarity, but always with love. And that is the biggest persuader of any counter perspective. That's what I would say here. Thank you so much. God bless. <clears throat> I'll add just a quick affirmation of what Ravi's already said to your point, but first just thank you all for uh, having me and uh, giving me your ear during this time of question and answer. I read somewhere that the number two fear in the world is death and the number one fear is public speaking. And when I first read that, I was surprised and then I walked into the size of this auditorium and it started to make a bit more sense. I do have a Yankees fan in the front row. Uh, that makes me feel a bit more at home, so I appreciate that. At least, at least there's one here. Sorry, it's... it's... <laughs> it's my dad's fault, it's not my fault. Just a quick affirmation uh, of what Ravi has said to that point. You know, we all take our political starting point. We go right back to the Declaration of Independence that all people are created equal. And if that is the starting point of any plausible morality, that every single person has an equal value, that their rights are universal, inalienable, and equal, well then there has to be something about every single human person which is in fact equal and which is completely unchanging. And so my question would just be, what is it? What is it about you and the people sitting next to you and every single person that's completely equal and completely unchanging? If you have a naturalistic worldview, it is really hard to answer that question. Anything naturalistic is along a spectrum. Some are more or less intelligent than others. Some are more or less happy than others. Some are more or less good at passing on their genes than others. What is it that is equal and undeniable and constant for every single person? And I think the only answer to that question is the love of God. The love of God is the only thing about you. It's the only thing about every one of us which is absolutely equal for every single person and which cannot change no matter what. It cannot be earned and it cannot be lost. So just to affirm what Ravi has said, as we get into political discussions, let's let that be our starting point and let's not be afraid to ask that question because if we're all agreed that that should be the starting point, we should be able to challenge people and ask that question, what is it that makes you and me and every single person absolutely equal. What is equally true and constant and cannot be lost about us, which grounds all of our political convictions. And hopefully that leads to some good conversations. Next question. Um, Dr. Zacharias, thank you very much for coming here today. I've been listening to your radio broadcast since well before I could walk and your ministry has really impacted my life, impacted uh, my own uh, view of the gospel and my own way of explaining things. So I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to come to the Philly area. Um, I am a physicist. I'm a graduate student at the University of Delaware, and in my discipline, facts are empirical. Um, there are things that we can see, that we can touch, and I have a hard time explaining to my colleagues who are used to thinking in this empirical vein how they can understand philosophical truth or how they can understand a God that they can't see. How do I respond to them and give them something tangible to hold on to about the gospel message? Great question, and I'll be happy to do it in, my, in our recent book, Jesus Among Secular Gods. I've made the comment that Vince's chapter on scientism is worth the price of that book. He really deals with the solid sciences, and your question is very, very pertinent and very real. We deal with this with faculty members as we speak across the globe with them. I'd like Vince to communicate with you on that and I will put a footnote to it as well, but I think he does it so well that I think you'll find it more meaningful. 
This is a question that I get really excited uh, to speak to because I think there's often this assumption that somehow science has disproved God, somehow science has buried God. And I was on uh, a show not, not long ago and that was the assumption underlying the entire conversation. And I was on the edge of my seat, I couldn't wait to get in because I think it's so not true. You asked specifically the question of how you can get someone to believe in things that aren't physical in nature. Well, there are lots of things like that in science and also in philosophy, which you mentioned. Gravity, numbers, sets, propositions. Most philosophers today are actually not materialists precisely because of some of these reasons. But my primary encouragement on this question would be, all right, meet people where they are. Let's start with the empirical then. Let's start with the sciences and let's ask that question. Has science pointed away from God? I don't think it's the case. Arguably, the two most significant discoveries in all of cosmology in the last hundred years point strongly to the existence of God. The first one, that the universe has a beginning. Go right back to the beginning of Genesis. People didn't believe that and it was discovered, and some of the greatest scientists struggled to believe it because they realized how well it would cohere with the Christian faith. And if you have a universe that didn't exist and then came into existence, you have to account for that change. What could cause that? What could be powerful enough and creative enough to cause that? The second discovery in cosmology, that the universe is incredibly finely tuned for life the way the universe needs to be in order for life to be possible, not just life as we know it, not just life on the planet Earth, but anywhere in the universe, the probability of that on just natural assumptions is incredibly, incredibly small. Some scientists put it as one part in 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. If I were to try to write that probability out for you, I couldn't because I would need more zeros than there are particles in the universe. One scientist likens it to a tornado going through a junkyard and just happening to produce a perfect airplane. How can we account for this? The probability based on chance is almost nothing. But what if it's the case that you have someone who's powerful enough and creative enough and intelligent enough and loving enough to desire to create human persons and to call them into relationship with himself. Interestingly, I saw an interview with Richard Dawkins where he called it a very interesting hypothesis, the idea that life on Earth could have been seeded here by aliens from a different universe. And I couldn't believe it when I heard it. I thought, wait a minute, Richard Dawkins is not against intelligent design? Actually, he just has a very specific bias against divine design. Let me just take this one step further. The very basis of all science, the regularity of the universe, the fact that we can expect that in the next second and the next minute and tomorrow, gravity, for instance, is going to have exactly the same strength. Why do we just assume that? Somebody might say, well, that's the way it's always been. But that's not an answer, that's the question. Why has it always been the same? And why can we assume it's always going to be the same in the future with perfect regularity? I actually think on logic alone, you have no answer to that question. Einstein said the universe's incomprehensibility, the greatest incomprehensibility is that it is comprehensible. Why do we have this regular universe that we can actually perform experiments on and discover scientifically. I think only God makes sense of that. And so bring that into the conversation. Maybe it's the case, not only that science hasn't disproved God, but that only God proves science. I hope that's helpful. Just wanna, I just want to add a brief footnote to that because in my semester at Cambridge, I had two very interesting faculty members. One was Don Cupid, who was an Anglican priest turned atheist. And uh, John Pokinghorn, who was a scientist who was an atheist turned Christian. And John Pokinghorn was one of the leading quantum physicists of his time, remarkable professor. I'm sure you would know the name. And what I came to the conclusion about 
Ultimately, it's not so much about the evidences. It's the willingness to go where the evidence leads. If you're really willing to go where the evidence leads and if it calls for humility and the bending of your knee, the difference will actually and ultimately come there. You see, in the sciences, as a physicist or as a lab technician or whatever, science can tell you what happens when this is joined to that or when this is added to that. Nowhere in science does it tell the technician that they must tell the truth. That's not a scientific imperative. That is a metaphysical imperative. So immediately when you move to the sub, move in for, from science into metaphysics, you come into the real world of why you love your children, why you wish to be loved, and why the truth matters. Nicholas Wolterstorff, marvelous professor from Yale, after he lost his son and it crushed his heart, made this incredible comment. When we have overcome absence with phone calls, winglessness with airplanes, summer heat with air conditioning, when we have overcome all these and much more besides, then there will abide two things with which we must cope, the evil in our hearts and death. The answer to those two will not come from science. It comes from knowing the very creator of the universe who explains your heart and raised his son from the dead for you and for me. Uh, uh, hi, I'm Sogat Dawari, and I grew up in Kathmandu, Nepal. And there, I grew up in a religion. I grew up in a society where the religion was totally different from Christianity in the United States. So, uh, so my question is, why is Christianity true and other religions false? Because there are many miracles in other religions as well, similar to those in Christianity. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. Uh, where are you coming? You come from Nepal? Yeah. I see. How long have you been here? Seven months. Wow, you're yet to be born. <laughs> Two months more ago. <laughs> or I've been born for 19 years. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Hindi bolte ho? No Hindi. Hindi bhi bolta ho? Bolte hai. Theek hai. So I will answer it to you in Hindi. Will that be all right? No, no, I won't do that. Okay. <laughs> you know, your question haunted me for a long, long time. Because I was born in Chennai, South India, was raised in Delhi. My ancestors were Nambudris, come from the highest caste of the Hindu priesthood, deep in Kerala. When Thomas the Apostle went to India, he was the one to whom Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. Pretty drastic statement. He went to India the land of 330 million deities and preached the message of Jesus. And he ultimately paid with his life. The reality about truth is that truth by definition is exclusive. Whether we like it or not, truth is exclusive. You may think, for example, Hinduism often says it's an all-accommodating religion. It isn't. It is not all-accommodating, and you know it well. Every Hindu believes in two things, karma and reincarnation. They may have huge differences, but the law of the cyclical rebirth of life and the karmic cycle and the reincarnation are realities within Hinduism. People think Buddhism was very ironic and very accommodating. Not true. Gautama Buddha was born a Hindu, and he rejected the caste system and rejected the authority of the Vedas. That's when he came with his fourfold truth and the eightfold truth and uh, for the noble path, the eightfold, uh, the noble path and the fourfold truth of the problem of suffering, the reality, and how you extinguish it. Every religion is exclusive. Every religion. Hinduism excludes. Buddhism excludes. You know, it's very interesting. In India right now, they have 
this new movement, you may have heard, heard it, Ghar Vapas Aa, come back to your home, Ghar Vapas, Ghar Vapasi. You were converted, come back. Why? If all views are ultimately the person's expression, why come back? Because they believe their own religion is exclusive and ought to be protected. The question is not whether religions are exclusive or not. The question is what can they answer to defend that truth? If you move from Hinduism into the, from the Vedas into the Gita, where Arjuna is talking to Krishna in that great conversation where uh, Krishna, Arjuna is going to fight his own brothers and he doesn't know the chariot driver is Krishna and he's asking him for advice on how I can go and fight my own brothers and kill them. He doesn't know who Krishna is, but he's giving the advice. Through the conversation of the Gita, Krishna talks about the prajapati, which literally ends up meaning the sacrifice. You ultimately need that sacrifice. But in the Gita, there is no sacrifice. He was on to the truth that there was the need. Only in the gospel is that sacrifice offered for you and for me. Why is Jesus the way, the truth, and the life? Because he answers the four questions with correspondence as truthful and coherence as the four coherent answers. It is for this reason that people like Carey and Charlie C.T. Studd and Henry Martin and others when they I go to India several times a year. I'm dharti ke admi hai. I'm dharti ke admi hai. I'm a person of the soil. I was born and raised in India. India has a fascinating philosophy. There's a song that you may have heard from Mother India. Dunia mein hum aaye hai to jeena hi padega. Jeevan hai agar zahir to peena hi padega. Which literally means if I've come into this world, I must live. If living means drinking poison, I must drink it. The fatalism that is present in many of the young, they are hungering for answers. It is not so much the robust attitude of smothering somebody, but the privilege of telling them that Jesus Christ offers his sacrifice for you so that you can have life with purpose. Mahatma Gandhi, who carried a New Testament all his life, made this comment, I like their Christ, I don't like their Christian, because the Christians had victimized him in so many ways. We as Christians need to apologize to the world for the way we have sometimes betrayed the trust. <laughs> But we do not go, we do not go to present ourselves. We go to present Christ. If you had the cure for cancer, you would not be sitting at home. You'd be telling the world with cancer where the cure is. In Jesus, you find the answers to the deepest questions of the soul and you present him as the answer. I'll leave that with you. I'll leave you with, I'll leave you with two footnotes. Why Jesus? I responded in one chapter to the very question you've raised, and also Jesus among other gods. You will see the coherence of his answers. All religions claim exclusivity. I believe in Jesus. You see the reasons for that exclusivity, because he describes my condition, provides for the malady, explains suffering, teaches me what the cross is about, and rose again from the dead to give me eternal life. That is what I present to the Indian people, and I hope you will follow those teachings too. Hi, um, my name is Corey. I'm actually a big fan of yours, so uh, it's uh, been listening to you for a while now. And uh, I'm I'm an artist and an aspiring author, and one of the things that I've noticed that it, in this culture, um, especially in here we see a lot of movies and a lot of literature and a lot of TV shows promoting philosophical um, beliefs that are that if not just wrong are actually kind of harmful to people so I would just ask what is the Christian perspective on art is there a way to counter some of these uh, more harmful lies that are being presented as truth I'll do a brief answer and 
Uh, Vince will tell you what we are doing with the whole world of art in the Institute. Uh, it's amazing these steps we've taken. I think it was Dostoevsky who said, first, art imitates life, then life imitates art, and finally, life seems to find the very reason for its existence in the arts. Uh, if that happens, it's a sorry end. Art is a glorious expression. We, we, my, my daughter, she's just come back from Paris, my oldest daughter, Sarah. She could spend every day in a museum of this world examining every piece of art she sees. She loves it. Uh, I'm more into the performing arts than the fine arts, but certainly I enjoy the best of mu music and the best of what the artistic world does. See, worship brought art into it, music. And if you go to Rome and anywhere, you see the glorious expression of the artists from the Renaissance and uh, how they glorified God with their work. For the Christian in his or her life, the parameter is very simple. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Holiness is not about, beauty is not a boundary-less thing. Beauty has to have boundaries, and that boundary is the difference between the sacred and the profane. If one chooses to do profane art, it is really not art, it is the exalting of the profane. And it may be that the artist has the in intention to show the horror of profanity through the process of the art, and it can happen and it can be done. I know a Hollywood f music writer who said the hardest part of his life was to watch profane acts taking place on stage and for him to compose the music of it. So I'll be standing in the wings watching this and really not wanting to see it because he said, I'm a family man, I didn't want to cross some lines. But he would see as best as he could and invariably would introduce some horror music in the process, because what was going on had some horrific ramifications too. So I say to you, the gift that God has given to you, if you do it as a Christian, do it in the beauty of holiness. As the world delves into art, we have to appreciate the fact that there are many parameters and possibility but we have to keep our convictions with the sacred and let the world see what beauty can do to the heart when it has the parameters of the sacred within it. That would be my simple advice in terms of the art, but I'm going to have uh, Vince tell you about what RZIM is doing with the arts now. Great. I'm a philosopher rather than an artist, so I'll give you a slightly philosophical answer, but I'll, I'll work my way around to the art. Um, my wife and I, my wife's standing just next to you actually, uh, Joe, we, we had the uh, uh, privilege of uh, viewing Michelangelo's David in Florence. Uh, it didn't initially feel like a privilege as we uh, waited in the cold rain for two hours to see that statue, uh, nor did it seem like a privilege as we had a uh, marriage discussion about whether we should continue to wait in the rain in the end. Uh, a few married people in the room. Uh, in, in the end, we did a, a marriage compromise. Joe wanted to stay and I wanted to go, and so we stayed. <laughs> but this is my point. We had seen that statue in documentaries, in postcards. That's why I thought, let's leave. We've already seen it many times. But when we saw it in person, we knew something. We didn't just experience something, but through that experience, we knew something about the beauty of that piece of artwork that we couldn't know through just hearing friends tell us about it or through the postcards or through the documentaries. In philosophy, we would call that non-propositional knowledge. But it basically means it's experiential knowledge. It's knowledge that you can only know in full by truly experiencing it. And I think knowledge of God is like that as well. I sometimes think about thinkers, feelers, and doers. You meet different people in life. Some people want to know the evidence. Show me the evidence. 
Some people want to know if this is true to my experience. Other people want to know, they're doers. Does this work? Is this going to make a difference in my marriage? Is this going to help me to sleep at night? You know what? All three of those are good reasons to initially be interested in God and to seek God. And ultimately, God wants us to love him with our whole selves, including each of those arenas. But the arts are so important because they sometimes allow us a direct route to truth that doesn't always have to go through philosophizing. And that, I think, is very important. Sometimes people are in a place, I was in a place in my college years where I had erected philosophical barriers to God. If I'm honest, because I wanted to be my own God. Nietzsche says, if there were gods, how could I bear not to be a God? That was a line that I resonated with. But the arts were a way where I couldn't help but recognize the beauty and the transcendence that was apparent in the world. And that pointed to me to God in a time of my life where it would have been very difficult for me to purely philosophize myself towards him. That's why as a ministry we are so committed to the arts. Great friend of ours, Emmanuel Lambert, uh, is in the audience tonight, who's an award-winning rapper. And our, tiered for Manny. And our assistant director, Sean Hart, at the Zacharias Institute is someone who spent a lot of his youth in a rap culture where he was far from God. And he said, man, I wish I had someone like Manny at that time, because Christian artists at that time largely had just withdrawn from that culture. But what that meant was not just withdrawing from the art, but withdrawing from the people who were interested in the art including my friend Sean. So I think we need to do good art, we need to do faithful art, but we need to engage in these cultures because not engaging is not just not engaging in the culture of art, but it's not engaging in the people who love that type of art, and we want to love every single person. I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much so, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. Hi, my name is Jackson. I'm a student at Penn, a uh, freshman. And my question is, if we as finite beings spend our whole life searching, we basically can only scratch the surface of all the information in the world. So how do we find truth in, in that pursuit? Very, very great question. And by the way, one more thing we sh I should say. Our new Institute of Apologetics in Atlanta has an art gallery in there and where we hope to do some wonderful displays of fine artists. That has already begun. You go on our website and you'll find it. And sir, your question on so much to know. You know, it's interesting. Charles Hartshorn, the famous philosopher in his 100th birthday, was asked what he wanted to say to the world as he reached that stage. He said, everything that needs to be said has been said. The only thing that needs to be decided is what to deny. What are you going to deny? Malcolm Muggridge had a famous line, all new news is old news happening to new people. All new news is old news happening to new people. Your point is well taken. There is so much that there is to be known, so much of wisdom and knowledge that you can accumulate. How do you really arrive at even any conclusions and where do you get off? There is a difference between comprehensive knowledge and meaningful knowledge. You cannot be a genius in all of the disciplines. You simply can't. In fact, when Stephen Hawking, in his book, made the comment that philosophy is dead, the theologians didn't have to respond. The chairman of the philosophy department at Cambridge responded. And he made this incredible comment, he said, the oracular Professor Hawking needs to know that he has not kept up with our discipline as much as we have with his. It's not true that you can grab this in single vision of the sciences. See, you go back across history, start off with the rationalists in the 13, 1400s. You moved after that to the empiricists or the metaphysicians as they were. From that, you came on to the existentialists. 
and the existentialists, you came to the postmodernists. Each one of them, in grabbing the finger of an epistemological approach, thought they had grabbed all of reality. So if you talk to Descartes, it was, you know, rationalism. If you talk to Hume, it was empiricism. If you talk to Camus or Sartre, or Nietzsche, it was existentialism. If you talk to Derrida, it is postmodernism. The mistake they made is in grabbing the finger of one discipline, they thought they had grabbed onto the fist of reality. All of these disciplines have their places. And so we have these specializations with each one of them having their value. That's why I think the Christian faith has such beauty to it. We want a faith that is rationally tenable. We want a faith that is existentially relevant. We want a faith that is empirically also verifiable, but also in postmodernism, we want the community of believers in the process. So make the distinction between comprehensive knowledge and meaningful <coughs> knowledge. And when you find that meaningful knowledge, <coughs> Excuse me. You will find that there are four components to meaning. Four. Wonder. That sense of enchantment. Truth. Love. And security. Wonder. Truth. Love. And security. You watch a little child. Wonder. But then all of a sudden they get old and they find out that the fairy tale is merely fantastic. It's not, not fantastically true, it's merely fun. Then you come to see the Gospels and the place of the miracle and the incarnation. You see that which is fantastically true. You enjoy the love of God and love in your relationship. You enjoy security of life beyond the grave. Wonder, truth, love, and security. You can find that meaningfully without even having a comprehensive knowledge of all that there is to be known. So I leave that with you. <clears throat> Just to add real quick that I think that's a brilliant question. Sometimes I ask people to draw a circle which represents all the knowledge that they have and then draw a larger circle which represents the totality of things to be known. And when you see just what a small percentage it is, you think, why should I trust anything that I believe? Look at the history of science and you see that the vast majority of scientific theories that we now consider to be true or that were once considered to be true now are considered to be false. It's a great question. We just walk around assuming that of course we can know things and we can know lots of things. Maybe that's a much harder question than we think. Take a naturalistic perspective. If it's the case that the sole guiding principle of human development is naturalistic evolution, then we as beings are created to be conducive for survival, not to be conducive for attaining truth. Those are two different things. It might be good for my survival if I've been badly injured to think that I'm gonna make a recovery, but it might not be true. Those are two different things, survival and truth. And from a naturalistic, atheistic perspective, to think that our brains are wired to give us the truth is like stepping on a scale and thinking it's going to tell you the time. A scale is not intended to tell you the time. That's not what its purpose is. And from a naturalistic evolutionary perspective, we as beings are not intended to produce truth. We're intended only to produce survival. So I think you've asked a brilliant question. And I think as you burrow down deeper into it, we're left with a really frustrating dilemma. How can we know anything? Maybe in your question is a pointer to the fact that if we are to know anything, small finite beings that we are, maybe it has to be because there is truth that has been revealed to us by someone who is much more knowledgeable than we are, who doesn't just know that small percentage of the circle, but who knows and who in fact is the totality of all knowledge. So it's a great question and I think it points to a religion that includes revelation of one who is true. in line and it just shows how this is, these are conversations that count and that need to take place. Uh, Robbie has poured himself out this evening as we can all attest, 
So we're actually going to close the evening um, at this point. But can we please, one more time, give Dr. Robbie Zacharias and Vince Vitale some applause. I may, thank you so much. Thank you. If I may, just yeah, you may remain standing. I'll let uh, my brother take over after that. But I, Aaron, take over. But I want to say this very quickly. What would be the one goal that I think that could accomplish something for your life here tonight? There was a music group called the Moody Blues that said this: Why do we never get an answer when we are knocking at the door? with a thousand million questions about hate and death and war. Because when we stop and look around us, there's nothing that we need in a world of persecution that is whirling in its greed. Why do we never get an answer when we are knocking on the door? There's the artist for you. And then he says this, I'm looking for a miracle in my life. I'm looking for someone to change my life. I was 17 years old on a bed of suicide in Delhi. I'd given up, completely given up. When a, when a person brought a Bible into my hospital room, I didn't own a Bible, I'd never opened the Bible. And he turned it to John chapter 14. My body was dehydrated because of the poison that I had taken. I couldn't lift my hand to hold the Bible. I needed my mother to hold it for me. And then she read it to me. And to you students, I want you to know I was a young student then. And I'm on the verge of, die, of death. And she reads the words of Jesus to Thomas. Because I live, you also shall live. Because I live, you also shall live. And I prayed this simple prayer. Jesus, I really don't know who you are. I really don't even know what all this means. But if you are the Lord who gives life the life I never had. Come into this life and change me. I need to be changed, not only what I do, but what I want to do. Five days after that, the doctor came and he looked at me and he said, Beta, which means son, I have given you back your life, but I cannot make you want to live. I have given you back your life, but I cannot make you want to live. I said, doctor, that's been taken care of by somebody other than you, who's given me what I wanted to do. What can I ask you to do? Your hospitality has been incredible, and Aaron, your team is fabulous. We are honored. I'm really honored every time. Before I come onto the platform, I say, what on earth am I doing here? What on earth am I doing here? There's only one answer. I'm here to tell you that in the person of Jesus Christ, take away all your prejudices, go back home, start reading the Gospel of John, and with a simple prayer, just ask the Lord Jesus if he is who he claims to be to reveal himself to you. If we at our office can be of any help, and they more can, we will be glad to help you. May you find him to be the way, the truth, and the life. Because he lives, you also can live. God bless you. Yeah. <laughs>